Hi, I'm David. I'm an engineer at Symbiotic EDA, and I'm also an undergraduate student at Imperial College London. So I'm going to talk about Project Trellis, which is bitstream documentation and FOSS tools for the Lattice ECP5 FPGAs. So one of the questions is, why choose the ECP5 FPGA over other parts? There are lots of exciting new ECP5 development boards coming out. For example, the tiny FPGA EX, the ULX3S, and I believe Al here is working on a black ice with ECP5 too. The ECP5 is much larger than the ICE 40, so that opens up a lot, a lot more possibilities. You could even do things like run RISC-V Linux on an ECP5 FPGA. It's nonetheless still relatively simple, so it's not too much work to build up a FOSS flow. I'd say it's definitely easier than the 7 series parts, for example. It's also, as far as I know, the cheapest FPGA per logic cell, certainly in single quantities, and it's very readily available. The other thing about the ECP5, which actually lets it down at the moment, is unlike Vivado, I'd say Diamond is not a very good tool at all. So there's a, quite an incentive to build a really nice open source flow. So the ECP5 has up to 85 logic cells. It's a LUT4 based architecture, so the LUTs are four inputs plus there's a flip-flop in every logic cell. Up to 3.7 megabits of block RAM, 156 DSPs, which is a lot for doing stuff like signal processing, that kind of stuff. And the other thing it has is um, 3 gigabit or 5 gigabit CERDES, which is something that uh, none of the current open source tools support. It's uh, something that I want to work on on the ECP5. It's not actually supported yet, but it would be something totally unique to open source FPGA tools if we could support that. So you could implement things like PCI Express then. Like most FPGA architectures, the ECP5 is split up into tiles. It's a grid of tiles. Logic tiles are split then into four slices. In the ECP5, a slice is two lookup tables and two flip-flops, or it can be used as a uh, adder with carry and two flip-flops. Um, it has a special mode, which means that the lookup table can actually be used as a RAM instead. And there are also cascade muxes, so you can build larger lookup tables inside the slice. So this is quite a bit more advanced than the logic cell in an ICE-40. Um, it has fixed interconnect wires between, between tiles and inside tiles. And then those wires are connected together with what are called arcs. Some of the arcs are configurable, which means they can be turned on or off inside the bitstream. Some of them are actually fixed. In other FPGA architectures and inside next PNR, we refer to arcs as pips. All of the arcs and wires inside the ECP5 are unidirectional. Unlike some FPGAs, there are no bidirectional switches. That does make um, place and route and fuzzing a bit easier. So you can think of all of the routing inside the FPGA as basically being a load of multiplexers. One thing that caught me out at first is that you can actually have more than one tile possible at a grid location. So you have the FPGA split up into grid locations. You can actually have multiple tiles at each location. Logic tiles are a single tile at the location, and they contain both the logic and the interconnect to other tiles. When you look at other functions like block RAM, they're actually split into multiple tiles. You have the so-called MIB tiles, which contain the functionality, so the block RAM itself, the configuration for the block RAM. And you also have what are called CIB tiles, which are the interconnect to other tiles. One thing that was a very nice find when I was doing the fuzzing is that interconnect bits are actually identical for logic tiles and for all the other tiles. So once you'd fuzzed one of them, effectively all the others then came for free. So just an example of how the, how the tiles work. PLC2 is a logic tile, so you can just have one tile. Inside there is all the logic and all the interconnect. That is just an interconnect tile. That's the interconnect tile corresponding to the I.O. at the edge of the device. You also have a few special tiles. Tap drive tiles, they're for the global clock network. They connect the global clock network into the logic tiles and other tiles. Long here, you have a row of DSPs. So you have the interconnect tile for the DSPs, the interconnects to other tiles. And then you have two more tiles containing the DSP functionality. And then you have also a few more so-called dummy tiles that are just padding inside the bitstream. 
So the current status of the ECP5 support, Tim has touched on this, but just to go in a bit more detail, we have complete bitstream and routing documentation for logic, interconnect, block RAM, and PLL tiles. We have partial documentation for the global network, enough to get stuff up and running. Partial documentation for the I.O. We effectively have the physical part of the I.O., what, what configures the I.O. voltage level, and enough to route signals in and out of the I.O. What we don't support yet is the so-called I.O. logic. So that's things like the flip-flops and the surdeses inside the I.O. pins. We also have documentation for some of the DSP tiles, but that needs to be finished off. As well as that, we have a next PNDAR flow that supports LUTs, flip-flops, IOs. That's enough to build a small Pico RV32 test example. And once that was working, that's a very good way of showing that the logic and interconnect documentation is sufficiently complete and correct. So how does Project Trellis work? How do, how, how do you get from an impenetrable bitstream to useful open source tools? The first step is very much to understand the low-level bitstream. So the first thing really to do was just to unpack bitstreams, find out their structure, work out what commands they use. So the ECP5 bitstreams effectively are a series of commands. Um, the most important command actually configures the chip itself. So the chip configuration is then split up into so-called frames, and each frame is made up of a certain number of bits. There are some other commands as well, things like set, resetting the device, checking the ID code, setting the user code, um, there's some security related commands to do with readback protection, and there are also special commands for initializing block RAM, because block RAM initialization is not actually part of the main configuration. So yeah, there's one really important command which actually configures all the logic and all the interconnect, and there's also a CRC in there that was a bit of work to find out. Then um, I mentioned before that the chip is split up into tiles. In the bitstream, a tile is a region, and that's defined by a start and end frame and bit. So you can imagine it as a rectangular region inside the bitstream. So to have a look at how the bitstream would actually be structured. First of all, it just starts off with what they call a comment header. That's just some ASCII strings about the bitstream. The chip obviously doesn't care about that. That's used by things like Lattice's programming tool to work out what device the bitstream is for when it was built, that kind of stuff. Uh, then you have the preamble that actually tells the chip to start looking at the bitstream. This is where the real bitstream begins. Um, there are some dummy FFs. I don't exactly know what they do, but they presumably the chip's doing something there. Then you have the first real command. A command is always one byte of the command type, and then three bytes of command configuration, and then sometimes a number of other bytes following that, which are called the payload. So the first command just resets the internal CRC register. Then you check the ID code. So this makes sure that the um, bitstream is actually the correct, the correct bitstream for the chip. Um, there's a bit of special stuff you can do here as well if you want to do some interesting things to do with um, playing about with different bitstreams on different chips. Then um, we're actually starting to get into more bitstream stuff. This sets the so-called control zero register. This is, contains configuration about how the bitstream should be loaded. This sets up the SPI flash configuration frequency. If you're booting off SPI flash, this would also be used to select quad SPI mode. And there are a few other things in there that I haven't quite worked out that I think are to do with dual boot mode. So you can have it load more than one bitstream if the first bitstream configuration fails, for example. That's something that um, TinyFPGA is using for their USB bootloader. Uh, then this is initialized ad address. This resets the internal address counters before the actual bitstream data is loaded. And then you have the bitstream data itself. So this just tells you to... The first byte is, the, is telling it that it's the start of the bitstream frames. Then you have some configuration to do with whether there's a CRC and... Um, how many padding bits you have between the frames, and finally you have the number of frames to load. And so then the first thing you have after that is the data for frame n minus one. For some reason the frames are in reverse order. These are the kind of things that just take a little while to work out. But so looking at how the frames are actually structured themselves, most of this is the frame data. Then between every frame you have a two byte CRC and one dummy byte. 
So as I mentioned, the frames and bits effectively form a kind of rectangular structure. So you have the you have the frames. Each frame consists of bits. And then at the end of the frame, after the bits, you have a CRC. Then when you start looking at tiles, tiles are effectively a rectangular region. So you have a start frame, start bit, end frame, end bit. And that's your tile. And each tile is a unique region inside the bitstream. So fortunately, I did have a bit of a starting point to work on this, because Lattice do release some documentation about what some of the commands are. So the gap filling there was more like things like, what CRC polynomial do they use? How are the bits ordered? How are the, what, what values are the CRCs calculated over? When the reset CRC takes place? That kind of little detail still needed to be worked out. So yeah, that was very much a case of just trial and error. I mean, there are only a certain number of CRC16s out there. In the end, it was just one of the most common ones. And then um, once you can unpack a bitstream, pack it again, and you get back to the same thing, that means that your bitstream handling code is reasonably correct. The other thing that was very fortunate to test this is Lattice provide a tool that actually can dump a bitstream, all the set bits in a bitstream, to a text file. So that was very useful for comparing the frame and bits of our unpacker compared to the actual lattice values. So this is quite similar to what Clifford used in IceStorm. They had something called a GLB file in the IceCube Ice40 tools. This is actually quite similar to that, and it's very useful for testing your bitstream code. So we can compare that and find out whether we're correct or not. And even more useful, that tool also gave us all the tile offsets that we needed in terms of frames and bits. So that way we can work out the tile grid in the bitstream without having to spend a lot of time working out all the little intricacies there. So it's always important to work out, actually, all the different things the vendor tools can do, because in many cases they do provide you a lot of useful information just in their output files and the little tools they include. In many cases, the vendor tools actually provide a dash help option on all the things. And when you run dash help, you actually find out about all kinds of little features that they don't really tell you about in the PDFs they give you, but the commands themselves have lots of little niceties in them always. So now we can unpack a bitstream. We actually need to work out what all the bits in that bitstream do, what interconnect they configure, what, where the lookup table initialized bits are, that kind of thing. So the first thing I started there with was to create a Python library using Boost Python. That means we can actually access the bits in a bitstream from Python. That way, we can use C++ for nice, easy, fast bitstream manipulation. But then we can use Python to rapid prototype tools for manipulating bitstreams, uh, so-called fuzzers. So to actually um, do the fuzzing itself, we use something Lattice called NCL files. That's a way of manually creating post, place, and root designs. So that's a very fast way to create designs. And it also means you can create your own very low-level designs. So you can actually create a design with just a single connection inside it and one specific connection without having to worry about anything else. Or, for example, correlating, OK, we have eight connections made, and we need to w work out which bits they correspond to. You can just look at one connection at a time. So it's a very fast, very targeted way to do fuzzing. There's also a Tukal API provided that can be used to list arcs and wires in order to target them. So I think the motto of the story there is really, it's really useful to spend time looking for useful interfaces before you go too far into writing bitstream fuzzing code. So the first thing I started with is fuzzing routing. There's also non-routing configuration to look at too. So to fuzz the routing, first of all, we use Tukal to list wires in a tile, arcs on those wires. Then we can just create a design for every single arc set, one at a time, and look at the bitstream changes between each of those designs. This is obviously not a super fast process. It's about one to two hours for a full logic tile running multi-threaded. But you know that's fine. I mean, Lattice produce a new FPGA every year. So if it takes a few days to run the fuzzers, then that's not really a big problem. And you know this is very automated. You can just set it running, and it'll run. Um, there was one little thing that the net names they use in all their tools are global net names. So it's like a location and a net name. In order to build a useful database for one tile type, as opposed to 
one single tile in the device, there's a sort of normalization process you have to go through to get normalized net names. So for the non-routing configuration, you have um, things like word style configuration. That would be things like LUT initialization. That's where you have basically an array of bits that you're trying to figure out. So the idea is you just create one design with each bit set and look for the change in each case. You also have what I call enum style configuration. So that would be things like IO type, where maybe the configuration is more like a string than a series of bits. And in that case, you just create a design with each possible configuration value and just basically build up a table. So in all cases, this is slightly more manual than the routing because you need to create a fuzzer with um, each configuration setting inside it and each value for that setting. But then the fuzzer will run that automatically. So then, once you've done that, it's nice to actually look at the results and look for patterns, see how correct you think it is. So I created a tool to render the fuzz database as HTML, and that's now published there. So this is, for example, what the database for a logic tile looks like. You have uh, some bits there for these all interconnect bits at the top, basically, and then these are configuration bits at the bottom. So. You have your big LUT initialization values. These here all interconnect. The letter is just the first name of the net name. So these are vertical interconnect wires, A inputs, B inputs, C inputs, D inputs, miscellaneous inputs, etc. So when you look at the database entry for single routing MUX, so this is the MUX driving the signal with this normalized net name. So the normalized net name is effectively a relative position and then the base net name. So in this case, the nominal position of the net. This doesn't really have a much physical meaning. It's just something that the lattice tools use that we follow for consistency. So the idea is the, no the nominal position in this case is x plus 3, x being the position of the current tile. So then for each net, you have a number of possible sources that can drive that net. And then here we simply list which configuration bits are set for which source, which driver of the net. So for example, if you wanted that net to drive it, you would set those two bits. The bits are specified using a naming, naming convention, F means frame, so that's frame 104, bit 9 inside the logic tile. And one more thing to note that's quite interesting is they use a sort of two hot structure, so it's effectively two one hot muxes, one after the other. If you look at a configuration word like LUT initialization, in this case, you just list an array of all the different bits. And then in this case, something interesting to note, the um, LUT initialization bits actually um, inverted. So that also means the default initialization value is all ones. Finally, for the so-called enum settings, uh, this is the database from a block RAM. So for example, for the different configuration widths, these are the bits you'd set for width 1, width 2, width 4, and width 18 has none of these sets. And then this would be, for example, the write mode. This would be the different possible write modes and the bits you would set to enable them. So then the other thing that we need to do is we need to actually take a bit stream and look at the bit stream as text in order to have a look at how the fuzz results actually work when you apply them to a real bit stream. So the idea is that we create tools to convert bitstreams to or from a simple text format, and then we can look at what the bitstreams actually mean and see if that makes sense. So you can check that the output is logical for a simple design. You can create an inverter, see that the LUT init bits are set correctly, check that the routing makes sense just manually. And this also, mean, this also has a way of printing unknown bits, so you can create a large design and see if there are any bits that we don't understand from our fuzzing, and then you can go back and see, well, what, what did we miss there? So this is what the text configuration might look like for a logic tile. Arc means that you have a, a connection between these two, these two wires. Word means that this LUT init value is that, is that value. And then enum means that text setting is set to no, for example. And the mode of this slice is CCU2, which is a carry slice. So then once we've done a bit of fuzzing, we actually need to find a practical use for it. You know, creating a text configuration by hand wouldn't be much fun to configure something like a system on chip. And you can just about make an inverter. If you're really patient, you could probably make a blinking LED. But for a proper demonstration, you need a place and root tool. So I'd already started working on Next PNR for the ICE40 at that point. 
Clifford's going to talk more about an XP and R in general, but that's the place and root tool that I've chosen for the ECP5 too. So the very much the next step here was adding the ECP5 architecture to NextP and R. But there was a bit of a catch here. The ICE40 architecture uses a very simple flat database structure, just contains details of everything in the chip in a single big database. There's no attempt to remove any repetition there. And you get away with that for the ICE40 because the ICE40 is not a big chip. At the biggest, I think the database is about 30 megabytes. You know, it's, it's not massive. And, you know, the ECP5 is 10 times bigger, a lot more complicated. This would start to get really quite unwieldy. I think in actual fact, um, looking at it, you'd be pretty much a gigabyte for the biggest one. So basically, there's a deduplicated approach that we use for um, the ECP5 to get rid of the duplication by creating a, a, the routing database and then looking for duplication and only storing tiles that are the same once. So it seems like I've got... Um, one minute left, so I'm just going to have to skip a few things and just go on to the next steps, really. So the few things I'd like to see would be finishing the place and route support for block RAM, distributed RAM, and carries. That's the most immediate thing to work on. Uh, finishing the documentation for the DSP tiles and adding synthesis and place and route support. One interesting thing to work on would be uh, DSP inference in Yosis. That would be something that's actually a more generic problem to work on. Creating a PLL configuration tool, we know how the Verilog PLL configuration bits map to the bitstream, but we don't actually know how to set those Verilog bits exactly. There are things like resistor and capacitor values in there that depend on the PLL frequency, and obviously Lattice provide a tool, but a really interesting project to work on, we're working on how do you actually configure a PLL, similar to um, ICE PLL for the ICE40. The other thing that's not very good at the moment is working on tools to do JTAG, to do programming, I've got a very hacky Python script to create SVS, S, SVF files at the moment, but that could really be improved. And also documenting the advanced features of the IO tiles and the IO logic registers. So you can email me, just search PRJ Trellis on GitHub or on IRC Freenode, the hashtag Yosis Place uh, channel. I'll be there. Thank you.